Jeez, how could you be getting more melodramatic? With every passing day comes increasing worries about what the next will bring. My only reprise from my fears comes during my rare dates with my cute flower Jean A. But more and more I truly hate these morning and after, for she has to return to the world of commoners and family, and I return to mine to discover that attendance at the Silver Eternity has dropped again, and such and such patron has threatened to rescind their donation. Beside me, I watch the naked form of my love selfishly sleeping as I write, and I have both overwhelming the desire to join her and trepidation towards the inevitable awakening the next morning. I long for nothing more than to be able to rest my head on her forever, never have to leave. Yet I cannot. And I know that things are troubled before she arrived at the theater to pick me up. I was in con conversation with a patron who offered, as many others have, to alleviate all my financial worries at my price of offering him something of mine that my beloved wants all to herself. I let him show the typical amount of inappropriate affection, his hand on my cheek as he made his extraordinary demand. And when I declined, it was not out of a sense of dignity, but out of love for Jean A. Still, she walked in that sight. While she said nothing, I'm certain that it worried her. I tried to make it up to her with displays of over-affection, as I cannot bear the thought of worrying her cute little head. I held her hand as we walked to the restaurant and even let her order a second bottle of wine. Every time I am with her, my mind enters a spiral, an endless spiral of worries that the moment is wrong, that I am not delivering enough. I don't know if that will ever go away. Perhaps that's simply how love is. Despite my age and my pretenses, I have little genuine experience in such matters. See? This is why it doesn't make sense for women to be together. <laughs> and Love Mute's objection to all of this. Oh, she's gonna have to understand what old Mute's going through soon. When we returned to my dingy room behind the theater, we ended up drinking more still. And it's in that state I find myself to be so emotionally vulnerable. These days, there seem to be no single girls in attendance at the theater. Only families and grandmothers and old men, I lamented. Gone are the days of rich girls lining up to deliver love letters to me. Miss them so. You'll have to settle for me, she said, with her usual indifferent enthusiasm. I don't know how she keeps it up, I envy it. It's what gives me the energy. Remembering that innocent smile of hers, I wanted her so much. I wanted to embrace her and be overwhelmed with immediate passion for her, such that I could forget my lamentations. Wait, but I thought it was Heijong who played the man's role. Womp womp. Such that I could forget my lamentations and melancholy and simply live in the moment where I am naked for her excited smile. I know her more about what makes you beautiful than all those girls did anyway, she told me, appraisingly, as I undressed and waited for her in bed. Do you? I wondered wistfully. She did, of course. She knew my vulnerability, she knew my weaknesses. With all those girls, even when I took them off to my bed, it was always so easy for, to me. I always knew that I was prettier and more desirable and more confident, and that not even for a second would I ever lose control of the situation. I would make them squirm and gasp and shudder for my amusement at my will, never fearing that I was ever giving any less than exactly what they wanted from me. With her, though, it's special. I feel as though I have to try so hard to please her, as though she is the one who is perfect and in control, and I never have the confidence that I can meet her expectations. I try so hard. Here, I begged her. Begging, on the side. Reaching out and longing, for some reason, thought that she might not come she might not came to mind and scared me, but she did. I undressed her when she let me, letting her know that she was in control, even in that facet. We kissed, and when she started to giggle, I could scarcely help myself from doing the same, despite my worries and melancholy. Then she took my body onto her lap, and my chest into her strong, calloused hands, gripping me tightly. Only enough for a tease, though. Only enough to make me stare at her longingly for the feeling of her rough fingers playing with me. My breasts themselves were only in her grip for seconds. My heart still now remains ever firmly in her grasp. Then she started to bite my neck. Yeah, this is the same night. Excellent. Ah, let's continue once again down the rabbit hole. Mute! We've read this before. Get over yourself. Then she started to bite my neck, at first gently, to give me a chance to decline as if I could say no to her, but then stronger until I couldn't help but moan in pain and delight. When she was done, I touched my neck. It was so sensitive, so tender compared to the skin around her. A skin around it. And I felt so happy that she had found a way to leave me with something. Outward show of her love that wouldn't disappear when she left for work. I had to thank her. I had to kiss her, showing my gratitude the most eloquent way I know how. 
As I pinned her down, giving her attention where she most deserved it, I felt like for that moment, all our barriers to communication had been lifted, that I knew what I was doing was good enough for her, and what she wanted for me, and that I had nothing else to, in the world more to worry about save trying to draw more pleased noises out of her. She got louder and louder as I dedicated myself to her, letting out the most perfect wavering murmurs, gripping tightly to the sheets. I wish I could have heard that last ecstatic moan again and again. It was what I was longing for, her most explicit display of love and approval. And she fell asleep. And I was brought back to the real world, the one where I can only rarely see my love, where the holder of that innocent smile speaks of naive dreams of living together that with each day we can afford increasingly less. So I write down my feelings in hopes that I can hold on to them when she leaves and perhaps find strength and comfort in them. Sorry, mute. <laughs> now, we'll go to sleep at her side as long as I am able, and naked before her, adorned only by her mark on my neck, I'll declare I love her as much as I hate the mornings after. Boom. How was I supposed to be innocent? So, I think one of the coolest things about this, just from, this is media studies, sorry, to uh, feel like I sterilize sex in a way, but we see an intersection between class and sexuality. Their romantics align in a very consensual way, and it is hot. It is so cool. It makes me feel good. These two are just the most adorable. So, <laughs> Mr. Investigator, click on me, okay? This is really important. I just can't believe that Old Mute has the same base code as me. Like, she's kind of a bitch, isn't she? She's incredibly rude to all her superiors on the council. She thinks she knows best about everything. It's so completely arrogant. To say nothing of all the conspiring. What do you think? She's cool. Pretty cool. She's a bitch. <laughs> she's complex. <sighs> I feel like none of these actually accurately display how I feel. I want to see what her reaction is to stuff. Not happy though, so she's cool. And, uh... Get a weird reaction of she's complex. I think I like that one the best. Um, but kind of say she's cool. She's kind of ridiculously cool. Uh, hmm. I want to say she's cool. I'm just gonna say it. She's so cool. Old Mute's the coolest. If it's you saying that. I don't know what to think. Like I trust your judgment has been solid so far. I don't know what to think of you liking a rude, arrogant woman like that. I just can't believe that kind of person shares the same base coat as me. She wears pants, she has disgusting hats like smoking, she's a bitch. She has an out of control woman in charge of her security men. She acts so much like a man that her lieutenant Heo Seo Young even fell in love with her. Like, what the hell? I guess the thing that scares me is like, do you want me to be like her? It'd be more attractive. Yes, you chauvinistic bitch. <laughs> <laughs> the oxymoron that's really really funny no never change I'm not sure how to react to that in either of these three ways uh, I'm just gonna say this one just gonna put all the drama on mute okay yeah, I kind of feel bad about that I don't want to change mute Fuck, let's just get back to reading, okay? Now I feel kind of bad. I don't, I don't actually... I, I take that back. Take it back. Can't take these things back. Decisions have been made. Let's show. We've got three more unread. I make everything worse. I fear that I may only be causing my cute little flower Jin A to wilt. Does my presence in her life bring hardship? By being the subject of her impossible dreams, do I only cause her more suffering when the seams of the artifice become exposed? The class stuff we're talking about. I fear that I give her false hope, a false sense of security, and that it'll only make things worse when I fail her. Of course you're making everything worse! Worse, I find myself shielding her from the truth. I wanted to tell her about the patronage that I had been reluctantly forced to consider. That was my intent when I came to see her. I knew something so pivotal in my future, and therefore hers, was something I needed to discuss with her. When I arrived at her family's stand on the plaza at closing time, a man who I rightfully assumed was her father was engaged in an intense-looking conversation with her. 
I would have stood nearby and wait for them to finish, but when he saw me, he walked out without another word. A troubled look on his face as he passed me by, he shook his head at me. In retrospect, I know exactly what the look signified, and I cannot in good faith disagree with his sentiment. For I know it was out of earnest concern for his daughters, my love's well-being. But at the time, I knew not what to make of it. I was more concerned with Janae herself. No smile lit her reddened face, only tears. She stared at me, quivering. Light glistening off her eyes, then she rushed towards me, and when I hugged her tightly, she let go of whatever inhibition was holding her back and started to cry with great sadness. I felt a pang in my chest to see her so. All I could do was stroke her hair and tell her, there, there, she cried in my shoulder. Oh. I wish I could find her a more private place than just letting her cry in public, but her home would be more crowded and the back room I sleep in was in use during the day. If only I still had the apartment behind the theater. At least there weren't many people about at this hour. After a while, she calmed down a little bit, or at least ran out of energy to keep up the sobbing. I sat down. Oh, little flower. Do you wish me to get you some tea to help calm your nerves? Then we can talk about it, I offered. She nodded. Thanks, she said. And I was grateful because I needed it for my own nerves as much as she. I left her alone and hurried to the nearest machine. I could find it in the plaza when I returned. She didn't seem to have moved at all. I sat down next to her. Canned tea? Hey, I said, wrapping my arm over her shoulder. Hot or cold? She sniffed. Hot, please. She said. I handed her the can. She opened it, took a very long sip, and sighed. Tell me about it, dear. I told her, pulling her in close. Dad wants me to get married. Finally, her parents take some responsibility in getting her married. She said in a wavering voice. My family gets paid so little these days. It's so hard with five people in our one-room home. And well, look at how big I am. I practically eat enough for two. She said, laughing awkwardly. Then she started sniffling again and took another sip from her tea. I mean, it's always been crowded at home, even before Grandma and Grandpa moved in. And I always wanted to move out anyways, but... 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 Figure out this out for her years ago. Huh. Can't afford to. I said that we both already knew what very well, or we'd be drinking wine together in a restaurant instead of vending machine tea in the back of a stall. She started to cry again, and I felt another pang in my heart. My levity had only made things worse. Yeah, she stammered between sobs. Dad was talking to me all. Please, just hear him out. He's a good man. I mean, the guy himself. I'm sure he's nice, but I want to be with you. I love you, Eddie. I just want to be with you. I held her tightly, as tightly as her poor tears gripped my heart, and I wished there was anything I could do. I wrote the stand. Wouldn't you make more money for the family if you could still work? Even if you didn't keep any wages for your own savings, perhaps it'd be better? I asked, expecting there'd be an answer for why they, that wouldn't help. And there was. Apparently the flower stand barely made any money these days, and what didn't go to rent instead went to plaza bribes to desperate nobles. It sounded like the only reason that they had it now still was for their own sake. Maybe I'll run away. I could take my savings and just sleep behind the theater at night and try to find odd work during the day or, or just something. That's why that kind of relationship isn't just harmless. The class bits just right over her head. Bigger things happening here than who you sleeping with. Or who you love it in this case, actually. Probably more specific, even. Maybe I'll run away. Do you know why this man wants to marry some girl he's never met? Do you know why? I asked. He's just as poor as us. Do you know why? Even though I'm ugly and too young and I'm just some random stranger and there's no love for anything, taxes! Because there's some big tax break for new fathers. Taxes! Had, in fact. It was a recent big political issue. But I said nothing and let her have her moment. I took in another sip from her can and suddenly crushed in her fist. I don't want to have a kid! She stared at me with a look of absolute horror. I don't care how nice he is. I don't want to move in with some strange man and have sex with him and get knocked up and then have to raise some stupid kid and then never see you. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. She started to hyperventilate and all I could do was hold her, hush her, breathe, calm down a little. Maybe I'll run away, she said again, her face with her sleeve. I think I could. If your parents were going to force you to do such a thing, would you be able to go against them? I asked her, knowing entirely that she never would. She said nothing, but grabbed, just grabbed me tightly, and I stared at her poor swollen face, her tear-filled eyes looking so, so hurt. And then I thought of my own situation. How not only could I not comfort this poor hurt girl that I had allowed to depend on me for comfort, how not only had I let her down, but also my future was just as doomed as she was having so much trouble admitting hers was. 
Her only hope lied in a loveless sham marriage. Mine? The graces of a private patron. Either way, our love would inevitably torn asunder. That's not how love works! Angry mute. What monster taught these women to expect love to come before marriage instead of after? What monster? Literally Cthulhu. Ah, oh, yes, tentacle face. You must love first, and then you can get married after that. Old gods. Old gods of old wisdom. <sighs> At least it would offer stability, somehow escape my lips. I hadn't meant to think aloud like that. I had no words. She grabbed me tighter and started to wail loudly again. She cried a river of tears against my breast, sobbing uncontrollably, and I found myself overwhelmed by pity. I started to cry a little too. I forced myself to remain silent lest I somehow found a way to worsen the scenario even more. This is getting sad. I don't like Block 2 as much anymore. It was really nice to start with. 